we get to talk about what I think is a favourite topic for both of us, which is how we can plan better cities for people who live in them both today and in the future. Can you tell me about your interest in cities? What would you say are some of the biggest priorities and challenges facing cities around Europe? The biggest challenges we have really are the, the transition to low carbon and, and climate ready cities, the energy transition in cities and how we manage that, how we bring in climate resilience into our cities to, to make us more ready for climate change. Um, and all, you know, in all that, how we do that in a way that makes for an inclusive and equitable city and, you know, as the European Commission puts it, a socially innovative cities. So I think we have a, a lot of very interesting um, challenges ahead of us. What does a circular city mean to you? I think a circular city is a city that uses materials and resources really well. Um, I think we have elements of Elements of the circular city are in place across Europe. So if you think about um, the sharing economy, you think about the way that mobility as a service is being rolled out in, in different you know, ways and, and shapes across Europe. We have some elements of, of it, but I think there's, there's obviously a lot, a, a long way to go, um, particularly around how we make the best use of materials and resources. Um, in terms of reuse, in terms of repurposing. Um, Arup recently released the Circular Buildings Toolkit, and I think that actually goes a long way to helping the construction industry think about how to use, um, make the best use of, of the materials that we need. Materials which are becoming inc increasingly scarce, it has to be said. So I think there is a real economic imperative for the circular economy and the circular city. And when we have such a big target, such as a climate neutral city, where do cities need to start first on that journey towards that? So I think in terms of cities becoming climate neutral, I think a lot of cities have started with their climate action plans. Um, there's clearly uh, big targets coming from the European Commission, which are being translated into national climate action planning. And now cities need to do their part as they account for 70% of Europe's population actually live, live in cities. So I think in terms of starting um, a climate action plan, putting some realistic goals in place, um, working out what are the projects that need to be delivered in terms of perhaps uh, urban energy, perhaps uh, transport strategy, um, sustainable urban mobility plans. So putting those strategies in place and then translating them into into practice. One piece of work that Arup has done around that is the supporting the Green City Action Plans for the EBRD. So we've done a lot of work in Tirana, in Warsaw and in other cities to help do that planning and come up with the investable projects that can then deliver those climate neutral cities. Um, another piece of work that we've been doing is around the green and thriving neighbourhoods with C40. And that's a really interesting approach because it recognises that the district and the neighbourhood is the right scale at which to, to start looking at um, creating really uh, you know, climate neutral, but also taking into account the social side. So creating those inclusive neighbourhoods and districts as well. Um, and that's also taking account of 15 minute city principles. And the other side of the coin to climate action and reducing carbon emissions is climate resilience and we've seen some extreme weather conditions and events over the past few years. Um, around climate resilience, cities around Europe are looking for high impact um, initiatives. Are there any forward thinking examples that you'd like to highlight of cities around Europe? Arup worked with the City of Milan on the 100RC, the 100 Resilient Cities initiative, um, and worked quite closely with the resilience Chief Resilience Officer, um, Piero Pelizzaro, uh, on, on that plan. And that, that's, a, that's been a really interesting journey for them because I think during COVID, they were able to adapt um, elements of that plan to deal with a crisis which perhaps was not necessarily um, foreseen. Um, and so one of the interesting things they've been doing as part of their overall resilience planning is they've had the flexibility to be able to look at how to open up uh, areas of Milan for, you know, to cope with this new need for people to be outdoors. 
And so, you know, using some playful city concepts, they've also opened up uh, public squares, which were formerly car parks, to people and created spaces that people want to work. So I think that's a really, they also, a really interesting example. I think they've also done a lot around active travel and uh, create using tactical urbanism principles to create temporary uh, active travel routes like cycle routes and so on. For, to, to cope with this kind of with this crisis, the urgency of the the COVID pandemic meant that people just had to trial and pilot some of the the ideas they might have had for a while and um, put them out there and see if they if they worked or not. The pandemic was really, as you were saying, a, a test of resilience for for cities, and it's also thrown into um, some disarray a lot of the plans that um, we'd been making around how cities would grow, how the economies would work within them. How do we um, start thinking about planning for cities now with the new and emerging patterns of work, which um, are showing up with hybrid working and work from home? Um, how do we know what city economies will be like in the future? That's a huge question. <laughs> And I don't think anyone knows the, the answer for sure, but I think what we've seen is the extraordinary resilience, the extraordinary resilience of cities as places where people want to be. So two years ago, a year ago, there was a lot of discourse about the end of cities and the end of the office. And I think what we're seeing now is that that was a bit overblown. But I think the reasons that people will go to the office and will go to cities will the needs of the citizens where the city has changed somewhat. And I think what we saw during COVID, one of the things we saw was this um, greater awareness of, certainly in Europe, of being outdoors, of wanting to use the city, uh, having a green and pleasant city and a, a traffic calmed city, but also a vibrant city that people could go to. So I think there's a much greater pressure on city authorities to create better environments for people to maybe rethink some of the uses that they had perhaps um, to create different types of uses for for people for the actual for the citizens who live in the city but i think what has changed is the the absolute um consensus that you need an office to work i think that's been broken and the there is a much different relationship now still being formed between people and the, the office. And similarly, if your city centre was all about offices, then people will have a different relationship with your city centre. So I think there's a lot to think through, um, but I think the importance of ex people's experience and that social side of things and that community side of things and the social innovation and social value of cities is, is 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 becoming more and more important. But it's important to get to ensure um, everybody feels welcome in city centres. Um, what do cities need to do to become welcoming places for everybody? There is a huge amount to do with design and the design of public space. So the design of public spaces so they are welcoming and inviting and offer a place for everybody. And I think at a micro scale, a lot of the interventions that we've seen into public realm, like putting seats in places, um, just very, very simple, allow people to sit down without having to spend money. And I think that's hugely uh, valuable, like locally to where I live, a lot of public seating, new public seating was put in. And you see older people resting with their shopping or you see someone with a child. So I think even those very simple elements actually create a huge a huge difference and um, so I think at, at that level and then there are obviously a lot of work to be done at a policy level around supporting people um, in cities and supporting people in um, to, to be in the public realm. Women particularly in transport planning have been very much overlooked. Um, we did a study recently for Transport Infrastructure Ireland where we looked at the needs of women using public transport um, and we did that for two reasons. One is that we need, we have a huge need to move people onto public transport and, well, onto sustainable modes of transport, whether that be active travel or public transport. 
And secondly, from an equity angle, women have been over, overlooked greatly um, during the planning process for, for many, many years. It's, a, it's acknowledged by the UN, among others. So we wanted to look and see what those differences might be and what the different needs might be. And so I think one of the things that we found is that safety is a huge issue. Uh, clearly, uh, women feel a lot less safe in public realm. And there are a number of interventions that can be made to improve that. But the other thing was around women's caring role. Um, most More women than men uh, still have caring roles in, in Ireland and in many other European countries. So they have, and they have different needs for transport. Um, the, the very complicated journeys that they need to make to, in order to drop a child to school, go to work, do some you know, shopping for the household, do some other uh, uh, jobs, errands, go get back and collect a child, mean that they are very much reliant on the private car because public transport is not reliable enough. And uh, in many cases, the act of travel is not, you know, certainly in cycling is not safe enough. So they find themselves trapped um, using a car. We found that in very many cases. Mm -hmm. So, and there are a number of interventions that, that can be made to, to improve that. But I think what we found is that convenience is very important, that um, affordability is important, that reliability is really crucial. That if you are relying on public transport to make all these journeys, you need to be able to know that the bus is, is going to turn up when, when it's, it said it is. And, you, and then there's, there's the question of access. So you need to be able to, if you're an older person, you need to be able to step up onto the bus, and that's not always easy. You need somewhere to wait, so the importance of seating at the bus stop. Um, so there are a whole lot of factors that you can start to look at once you start to take a, a person-centred approach to, to design. Absolutely. And staying on um, travel, historically, there's a number of cities across Europe which have developed in a way with low density suburban uh, housing, which means that people have been reliant on their cars, um, which has very much led to that car dependency and that results in congestion and the environmental impacts which flow on from that, such as air pollution and the carbon emissions. As city populations you know, continue to grow, so will become more uh, populated, how can we improve access for people to the economic and social opportunities in cities without increasing that congestion. So I think land use has a huge amount, a huge part to play in around uh, that relationship with travel demand. And so better land use policies that allow for, um, you know, the right density of, of housing um, with employment, with entertainment, with, uh, you know, the, the, the various things that people need, banks and, and so on. Um, you know, al allows for us to reduce that travel demand and it also allows for potentially um, active travel modes to be used. So it's much easier for people to walk, it's much easier pe for people to cycle. And the density allows for, um, you know, greater frequency of, of public transport. So I think that, that land use and travel demand are two things that really need to be looked at together. Coming back to sort of the earlier part of your career, you have been thinking about digital and smart cities, I think, long before they were on many other people's radars. What exactly is involved in digital transformation for a city? So I've been uh, looking at smart cities for probably since 2008, before they were called smart cities. <laughs> um, so we, and, and we always think about the use of digital for cities in, in two ways. One is around enabling the right type of experience for people. So enabling people to live in the city as, as easily as possible and creating good experience for, for people. And the second is around enabling operations. So enabling the, the running of the city systems and services. But I think a really important point to make is that um, digital transformation uh, is not should not be done for its own sake. So you often see a lot of talk about the smartest city and, you know, this is a great smart city. But actually, it should be about this is the most livable city or this is the most sustainable city or this is the most socially equitable city. 
the technology should blend into the background. The technology should be able, the technology should be there to deliver the livable, the sustainable, the, the equitable city. Designing compact urban environments is a key priority for many cities around Europe, which is a really important and big aim. What's an example of a city that you think is getting that right balance of using technology to enhance livability for its citizens? What is your process for turning a policy like that into delivery on the ground? So I think what's really important is to think about outcomes and to think about um, what is it that you want to achieve. Because the policies, we can have some very well-designed policies, which are then quite difficult to implement. Everything in a city involves multiple stakeholders, whether that be different departments in, in the municipality itself, the transport agency, the communities. So there are multiple stakeholders always in every single um, city policy that needs to be enacted. So having that strong focus on outcomes, um, having the right mechanisms to be able to manage stakeholders, bringing citizens and, you know, explaining things in a non-technical way to people um, to, uh, to allow them to participate in the process and to, um, to make positive contributions is, is really important. Um, and then having um, that strong focus on outcomes enables you to perhaps experiment a little bit along the way. So knowing what you want to achieve and what the markers of success are perhaps allow you to perhaps use some ta tactical urbanism uh, methods, so to trial perhaps a, an active travel route, a, a cycle route, um, to trial pocket parks, to do things, to trial pedestrianisation. Um, to do things in a very clear way and then being able to monitor and measure those things so that then you can go back to the community and say, we tried this and it had these particular impacts, this worked, this didn't work, how do we trade these things off? I think that allows you then to, to iterate um, on your way to achieving the outcomes that the original policy uh, was formulated to deliver. Great. And taking people on the journey with you. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Taking people on the journey is really key. So there's a lot of um, big city reform programs and initiatives out there, but sometimes there can be resistance around the cost of some of these um, important uh, projects to deliver. How do you counteract that resistance and you know demonstrate the value of of a climate neutral or climate action plan or um, a resilient strategy? I think it's important to see the costs as actually investments, um, that we're actually investing in, in outcomes that we want to achieve. You know, for example, in the energy transition, we are moving away from fossil fuels. That is the, the direction of travel. And so investing in renewable energy and re re investing in those, um, those, those types of uh, projects um, is about getting a return, is about moving us along a transition and it's, and it's something where investors can get a return. So I think it's really about in investing um, rather than thinking of everything as a cost. Lane, what would you say is the role of the private sector in helping to shape the city and people's experience of it? So I think the private sector, um, particularly building owners and building developers, have a huge role in the city in any case. And so I think they have a real role to play in terms of how they uh, contribute to public realm in particular. And the work that we've done with IPUT on the Making Place report uh, really looked at how, what was the role of the space around the building and you know, creating perhaps public space within a building to really make a contribution to the public to the public realm. And by doing that, make a positive contribution to the city, but also create a more vibrant and enticing place for the building occupants as well. And so that work really looked at that in more detail and proposed design strategies for building owners and building developers and city authorities to look at um, in terms of how that vibrant uh, piece of placemaking could be achieved.